to have everybody with us. We're going to try to deal with some issues in here this morning that uh, I think are very important when we study this. It's good to have Brother McGee and then his family, his wife. Good to have you. Are you through school? Halfway. Okay. Amen. It's hard to study when you get old, isn't it? <laughs> Just kidding, brother. <laughs> All right. Turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter number 2. Matthew chapter number 2 and verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now this is Herod, the so-called great. He's an Idumean. In other words, he's an Edomite. And he is a usurper to the throne of David. The Lord promised that David's throne would be in perpetuity. Here's a man who is a usurper of that throne. He has no business, in other words. He has no more business uh, reigning over Israel than uh, Pontius Pilate would or that uh, uh, the, um, the uh, Caesar. But in any event, God still overrules things for the glory of God. Look at this. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now, as I mentioned to you before about the star, a lot of folks go back and they trace, uh, they, uh, they try to find a star, you know, some, some, some record of a star or something, a planet or conjunction of planets or whatever, to try to fulfill this prophecy. And I told you before how that it may very well be an angel because the angel appeared to them when they were in the east and it led them and then it came and stood over where the child was. Stars don't do that. But angels in the Bible can be referred to as stars. And so we find a star here, the Bible says, that led these wise men, the magi, they came from the east. Now how many? We don't know. It could be three, but it could be more than that. And tradition gives you their name. But what I want to deal with you this morning is this. Now look at what it says. Where is he that's born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east or come to worship him. Now why would they be coming to worship him? He's the king of the Jews. You see what I mean? It is the tent of Shem that Japheth will dwell in. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Not the Babylonian God. Not the Persian God. Not uh, Zoroaster or any of that. They come to worship the king of the Jews. And when Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And well, they should have been, because this is a monster. This is a monster. Herod the Great was a monster in every sense of the word. He had his own children put to death. He had his own wives put to death. He was a bloody monster. Verse 3. All Jerusalem was troubled with him. And when he'd gathered the chief priests and scribes, the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. So now we have knowledge of the Bible. Christ, the Mashiach, the Messiah. Where is the Messiah going to be born? And they said, they knew the Bible, the Old Testament. They said, in Bethlehem of Judea. They quoted Micah chapter number 5. And uh, for thus it is written by the prophet. It's, a mark, it's remarkable how that they have the prophet, but they don't believe the prophet. You see, they've got the Bible, but they don't believe the Bible. It's just like Samuel Clemens, uh, Mark Twain. His pseudonym is Mark, was Mark Twain. He said, he said, uh, he said, it's not the things in the Bible that I don't understand that bothers me. It's the things that I do understand. You see, that's what he said. And even at that, he really didn't believe the Bible. Now, what is, look, at, look at verse number five. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people. Then Herod... When he'd heard privately, called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared, and sent them to Bethlehem and said, 
Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. You're a lying dog. You see, the Bible is accurate, very accurate, but sometimes the Bible records lies. Okay? This is a lie. He didn't want to worship this child. He wanted to kill it. So in verse, verse number 9, When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went, stood before them, till it came and stood over where their young child was. So we have every reason to believe that this is not the, uh, the babe in the manger with the shepherds, you know, and all that. This is a couple of years later. But if you notice, the reason we say that is because when the wise men departed another way and went back to their country, the scripture says that he in his rage went out and killed every child from the age of two down, under two and under, knowing what he's talking about here in the time element. So what we have here is the birth of Christ in the land of Judea, the land of Judah, to the people of Israel, the son of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, his mother and his, uh, his uh, what would you call him, his foster father, that would be about the best you could say, foster father, Joseph. You have their genealogies in Matthew and Luke. The genealogy in Matthew is the genealogy of the king, and the genealogy in Luke is the genealogy of the man. Luke's genealogy most people believe, and I am one of them, is the genealogy of Mary. Matthew's genealogy is the genealogy of Joseph. Therefore, he qualifies through the genealogy of Joseph to be the king of Israel. And through Mary, we have the virgin birth. God became a man. Now, that's one of the most remarkable things that's ever happened, and it defies explanation. But we do know this, we know the Holy Spirit came on her, wrapped her in light, and she was impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. A spirit being brought forth a human being. Now think about that. Think about it. We're not talking about a creation now. The Lord Jesus was not created and the God-man was not created. The God-man was born of the virgin but he was boy he was begotten by a spirit being and so the next time someone comes along and tells you that spirit beings cannot produce physical beings take them to that scripture and have them explain that to you think about that that's a very important deal here because a spirit being created a human being when he created adam's body from the dust of the ground and then breathed life into him and he became a living soul and God of course is the source of all light. And there's what's important about this and that is that the Israel and the Jewish people have a special place in prophecy and the mind of God. There's no question about it. The Lord Jesus Christ could have only come from one people and it would be the Jewish people, only one in the tribe of Judah. <coughs> And these people, therefore, are set apart. Go back to the book of Zechariah, and chapter number 6 with me, and verse number 12. Zechariah, chapter number 6, and verse number 12. Zechariah 6, 12. And speak unto them, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch, okay, Zamach in Hebrew, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Now when you come back, we're talking Wednesday night. If you'll remember, we were here Wednesday night talking about Zerubbabel, verse number 9, chapter 4. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Sixteen years it lay dormant. And then finally, the house was to be finished. This is Zerubbabel. All right, he laid the foundation of the house, the temple of God. But when you come to chapter number 6 and verse number 12, the Bible says, He shall build the temple of the Lord. He who? The branch. This is future. This is a prophecy saying that the branch, this is the one who's coming up from Israel. He's coming out of the root of Israel. 
is the one who's going to build a temple in the future. Look at chapter number 3 of the book of Zechariah and verse number 8. Now hear, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Did you notice that? Now here's something else to look at this. Now I'm going to give you two. We'll come back to this later because there's other things I want to deal with. But look at what he emphasizes in verse number 8, chapter 3. Behold, I will bring forth my what? Servant, the branch. Now look at chapter number 6 and verse number 12. And speaketh them, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. Do you see that? In one place the branch is referred to as the servant, the other place is the man. Now, there's two other places in Scripture, one in Isaiah and another place, that refer to the branch. And four places in particular that refer to the branch and put him in a classification that connects him with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This branch rising up from the root of Israel, not from Gentiles, but from Israel. This branch rises up, and it comes from the house of David. God promised David that of his seed, one would sit upon the throne of Israel. And in his deathbed, the last thing David said was, I know God's going to be true to his word, and he will raise up a king. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is a king, no question about that. When it comes in Revelation 19, he comes as the king of kings and lord of lords. But don't you think it's quite remarkable here that you have four references to a branch in the Old Testament? One of them is the branch as the servant. The other one, the branch is the man. Another one is a branch as the king. And then another one is the branch as that eternal one. Matthew's the king. Mark's the servant. Luke's the man. And John is that eternal being. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The internal differences between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are, are, are just mind-boggling, which is a different study in itself altogether because of what we want to cover in here this morning. But it's something else when you look at how each one of them probably completely, you know, have no idea what the other one's writing. Although there's a great tradition that says that Peter stood right over Mark and dictated to Mark what Mark should write. Now, that's tradition. The Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, right? Well, when Mark wrote Mark, he wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Maybe Peter was there, but Mark was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You see, in plain of words, Mark's words are not Peter's words, although Peter is an apostle and he can write scripture, but Mark is writing. And Mark is writing about the servant. No genealogy goes straight into his work. But now here the branch is talking about one rising up from Israel, all right? The branch comes up, and he shall shoot up. He will grow up, all right? Now where's this coming from? This is coming from Israel. Now go to the book of Daniel, chapter number 12 with me. Daniel, chapter number 12. And look at verse number 1. Daniel, chapter 12, and verse 1. This introduces something. In the, in, the, uh, in the creation of nation states, that's very important to understand. Nothing happens in a vacuum. Nothing. There is no such thing. As a matter of fact, nature itself hates a vacuum. What do you mean by that? You let a vacuum form and something will go right into it immediately, right? Okay. So, the Bible is the same way when it comes to, for example, a nation state. What's it here for? How long will it last? Do you remember the Assyrians? Have you met an Assyrian lately? How about a Babylonian? You know any Babylonians? You don't, of course not. How many know a Hittite? <laughs> you don't, but you don't doubt that they lived. They were here, and they had their time on earth, and their time passed away. Now, I quoted Samuel Clemens a few moments ago to you. And Samuel Clemens was one who certainly believed this. He believed that there is a divine being, and one of the proofs of the fact that there is a divine being is Israel. The fact that they exist. You think about that. You have people over there walking down the street of Jerusalem that speak perfect Hebrew that Isaiah could understand. You know any Hebrew? 
How much older is Hebrew than English? Did you know that English is still a morphing? That English is the largest vocabulary in the world? That an unabridged English dictionary is that thick? That there is no language on this earth that comes anywhere near as big as English? Old English? Middle English? Modern English? Well, modern English, where did that start? 1600s? The King James Bible is translated in modern English. Well, what am I hearing today? I have no idea. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> don't have a clue. <laughs> I really don't. But the bottom line is that Hebrew is an ancient language of an ancient people that have an ancient covenant with an eternal God. And so when you come to the book of Daniel, chapter number 12, Daniel was one of the prophets of the exile. His name means Elohim or El will judge. Dan means judge in Hebrew. The meaning of it is judge. El is a shortened form of Elohim, which is the, shows up in Genesis 1 in the beginning. God, Elohim, that's a generic word that means a spirit being because Elohim can be translated as angels, gods in the Old Testament. So Daniel is he that God uses to judge these people. And that was the ministry of Daniel. And look what he says in chapter number 12 and verse 1. In that day, in the last days, see this? At that time shall Michael, now that's another Hebrew word. And what does that name mean? That word means, who is like Elohim? In other words, who is like God? You have two angels named in the Bible, and only two. Now, you've got Raphael, and you've got a bunch of uh, Uriel, and a bunch of them out here in the Apocrypha. But there's only two of them in the Bible that are named. Gabriel and Michael. Gabriel means man of God. And that's the one who came and announced to Mary she was going to have a child. Michael is the one who contended with the Satan. He contended with the devil for the body of Moses. In plain words, he is so connected to Israel that anything that relates to Israel goes through Michael. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Michael stands for the children of Israel. Who is like Elohim or who is like God? And so to Satan, when he contended for the body of Moses, you must, you must understand Satan had a reason for it, a nefarious reason, no doubt. But when he, when, he, when he contended with him for the body of Moses, Michael said, The Lord rebuke thee, Satan. The Lord rebuke thee. The Bible says in Revelation chapter number 12, there's war in heaven. That hadn't happened yet. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Remember, Michael is married to Israel. If his name shows up in the Bible, Israel's going to show up. Every time the word Michael shows up in the Bible, look for Israel. So it says here that he stands, in chapter number 12, At that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. All right. Now follow with me where I'm leading you. Michael stands for Israel. He's an archangel, folks. We're talking about some power here, okay? We're talking about a mighty being. We're talking about a being that is at least equal to or maybe even superior to Satan. But remember, Satan is no pushover. He's the anointed cherub that covereth. Only five of them and Satan is the one who fell. And he has enormous power. Don't play with him. Don't mock him. He'll sift you like wheat. So we have here an archangel that's going to stand up in the last days. And he's going to stand for Israel. So they've got a big one fighting for them. Now, how many ever heard of Tom Horn? He's got a, he's got a release out now that's called The Belly of the Beast. For some time, Tom Horn's been dealing with a lot of these issues that relate to the founding of America. The District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., is the seat of the federal government of this nation. I would highly recommend any child to go there and look at it. But the District of Columbia, being the federal seat of this nation, the 
the, the streets and the, the layout of this city was done by a Frenchman. And without getting into a lot of the stuff that Tom Horn gets into that I've talked to you about before, I simply want to put it this way. The people who founded the structure of Washington, D.C., let's put it that way, were occultist that believed America was a new Atlantis. And they believed that America would be the place where they could raise up Osiris, which is a type in the Old Testament, of the raising up of the Antichrist, Revelation 13. And that he would rise up through America, and from that point he would rule the world. You have been deceived in the last 40 years by a number of presidents in this country who are globalist, both Democrat and Republican. That's important you understand that. Both Democrat and Republican. They're globalist. Do you know what's happening in France right now? Have you kept up with what's going on over there? It started because of a fuel tax that Macron had put on, um, over there they burn diesel fuel, most of their automobiles apparently run on diesel. And so he put a fuel tax on that and enraged the people. But what's happened now is this thing has spread from France and it's spreading throughout Europe. Why is it spreading throughout Europe? It's spreading throughout Europe because the people in Europe are beginning to wake up. Their sovereignty and identity is being taken from them. And the reason it has is because you have an elitist, and right now through Belgium and through the European Union, but it's more than that. You have an elitist group of people who are going to rule this world, and they're going to have a one world government, and whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. I think that's what Henry Kissinger said about 20 or 30 years ago. He said, whether you like it or not, we're going to have a one world government. Okay? Now, you know, that's, that's a kind of an overview of what's going on. You get into the details. Then Brexit, of course, is where Great Britain voted to pull out of the European Union. The British people said, we want to, we want to control our destiny. And for whatever reasons, you have Germans, for example, uh, uh, Merkel, she brought all these, uh, these people into Germany and now they're raping their women and they're robbing them and, and everything's happening because they can't mix. They're not the same kind of people. And they're beginning to understand it. But here's the point. America is called a superpower. And we stand up and we say constantly, God has blessed America. And we do believe that this is, has been the only nation on this earth where we have had real freedom to worship God. Real freedom in this country. So far. But something's going to change. Now when a president is sworn in into the United States president, while he is taking the oath of office in a building... I don't know how close it is, but it's, it's full of 33rd degree masons that are in deep, in some kind of a, in some kind of a, a cultic ceremony, they're praying for Osiris to come up and fill that president and be resurrected spiritually from where he is into that man and that man becomes the one who takes America and the rest of the world into the new world order or the one world government. They're praying for that. Now if the Bible defines anything, it defines the Antichrist. And Revelation chapter number 13, the Antichrist is not only against Christ, but he is set in contradistinction to Christ as being a different Christ. See what I mean? There's a comparison going on here. You've got the real Christ and a false Christ, a pseudo-Christ. You've got the real Lord Jesus Christ, and the, Paul said, another Jesus. You have the Holy Ghost and then an unholy ghost. You've got the truth of Christ and the lie. All right, America is being fed a constant diet 
of, a, of an adulterated gospel of a false Christ. And the reason it's being fed this is so it will be able to receive this, this spirit, this, this resurrected Osiris who they're praying will go into that president and lead that nation and lead the world into a one world utopia, into a one world spiritual village. And a, a uh, as uh, what do they call it up there in the UN, where they get all the religions together, I forget the name of it, Congress of Religion, something like that. They want all the religions of the world to become one. You can keep your identity, but we all serve the same God. In other words, a one world religion, one world government, one world army, one world police force. That's what Interpol is about. Interpol is a one world, is a world police force. You have a world court over there where they want to try Americans, come in and take you out of your country and take you over there and try you in front of their court. What do you think about that? <coughs> Bypass the sovereignty of this nation and carry you off somewhere and try. You say, well, that's crazy. No, it's not, folks. These people are deadly serious. So when's it going to happen? Well, here's what happened. Donald Trump is not a globalist. And I am not a defender. The more I see, the more I understand this man has a, he had a problem, okay? And if you try to defend that, you got a problem. Right. You got a problem. You're a hypocrite. If you excoriate Bill Clinton for what he did and then turn around and support Donald Trump for doing the same thing, then you're a hypocrite. But, do you know that it says of, of Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, I was reading it the other day, God called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. <laughs> and, and, and folks, Nebuchadnezzar is no paragon of virtue, believe me. And he had his, 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 uh, his uh, just like Solomon, uh, his uh, you know, a multitude of wives and all of that, harem, that's what I'm trying to think of. His harem, he had all that. So, so what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say this. I'm observing this and I'm watching this. And it may very well be that God has given this country just enough time, a reprieve, by showing them, if anything, Donald Trump has awakened people to globalism. How many of you knew anything about globalism two or three years ago? But now you do. Now you do. Donald Trump has awakened them. It's not that, he's, that he, per, he you know, says anything about it, but he's a populist. He said, I'm a nationalist, and that's exactly what he is. And, of course, the news media, they try to, when he uses a term like nationalism, they demonize him with it because they define the terms. No, they don't define the terms. Just like Macron said the other day over there, he said to Trump, he said, he said you are not a patriot. So they go into this big thing in the country trying to define patriot. There's no definition of patriot, folks. Macron is saying, Trump, you have denied the one world government. That's what he's saying to him. Exactly. And to Trump's credit, he has denied the one world government. He has. In plain words, regardless of all of his warts and all of his problems, and Lord knows he has a multitude of them. <laughs> I do believe that God is going to use that man and has used that man, if nothing else, than to awaken people to the situation and condition of this world political scene and the position, the situation of the church and where it's headed. Who stands for America? Michael stands for Israel. That hadn't changed, that won't change. Who stands for America? In the 1800s, a Swami, some Hindu, uh, one, of their, one of their anointed goddesses or whatever he was, came over here and he got to New York Harbor. And he was going to come over here and he was going to speak because they wanted to hear this guy. He had the anointing on him and he was something else. And he was about 12 years old. This was in the 1800s. They got him to New York Harbor and they were about to disembark the ship. And that Hindu said, uh, I can't go. I can't go in there. I, I can't. I can't put. I can't. I can't go in there. They said, "Why?" He said, "There's a wall right in front of me, and I can't cross that wall." You know, they had praying Christians back then. 
In the 1800s in this country, we had Christians by the millions. I'm talking about real Christians, real believers, real revivals, real salvation, real worship services, real churches. The whole, all of it real back then. Men like Billy Sunday was preaching back in those days. Dwight L. Moody, Peter Cartwright, Sam Jones. They were preaching the word of God. And he said, I can't cross that wall. And the reason he couldn't cross that wall is because the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel stood in America. And that, that whatever you want to call that stuff from, Hindu, that from, 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 from uh, India could not cross that wall. But what have we got now? Now what have we got? Now what have we got? So what's all this mean? What does this mean? You can take an ancient map of Babylon, an ancient map of Babylon, Babylon. You can lay it down and you can take a map of New York City and superimpose it over the top of that map of Babylon. And I'd be dogged if they're not just almost practically the same. That's scary. You know what that means? That means to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. When Israel, when, they, when, when, they, when the average Jew was living under the iron fist of Caesar, you know, he had to render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. That's what the Lord told him. Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. He paid his taxes. Did you know they taxed people 2,000 years ago? They're good at it. He paid his taxes. He said, abide by the law. The Apostle Paul taught that in the book of Romans. Abide by the law. <clears throat> Respect the authority of civil government, and you'll have civil society. But remember, who stands for you? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That's who stands for you. That's who stands for you. Yes, sir. That's who stands for you. What do you say? You say, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. That's what you say. That's what this is about this morning. Tom Horn, this thing on uh, the belly of the beast, uh, he gets into much more lurid detail about what went on with the pharaohs when they sailed down the Nile River and they were initiated into the, the Osiris rites and all of the, all of the sexual things it had to, that it had to do with and every bit of that. Uh, Tom Horn gets into all that. And uh, if you want to watch that and study it, well, you, you begin to under, you'll get a good understanding of the foundation and basis of occultism. You'll get you'll get an understanding of the of the Capitol Dome and the uh, the uh, obelisk. You'll understand what they're there for, and you'll understand all all the uh, uh, inferences from it. What it's pointing to, and that's where it is. So there's you know that's what it's the largest of its kind. That that obelisk up there in Washington D.C. is 600. And 66, numbers stamped right on it, 666 feet, 666, 666. I wonder why they had to do that. Didn't they know the Bible in Revelation 13 said 666? You, you know why they did? They had to do it. That's why. Or that or they were proud of it. They were proud of it. Amen. Amen. Have a nice day. <laughs> I bet you didn't hear that on the morning talk show. <laughs> Woo! Well, you just have to uh, you have to kind of watch it. It's it's amazing. For example, in the Old Testament, God told Ezekiel, "said Go dig in the wall." So he started digging in the wall. You know what he found? He found women doing what? Weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz is another name for Osiris. All right? Now look at it. Here Israel is being adulterated with a pagan garbage around them. See? And then he found the leaders of Israel. So dig a little further. He found the leaders of Israel turned toward the sun with their back toward the holy place in the temple. In plain words, they had turned their back on God to have their sunrise service. 
because that's when they worship the sun god. Now look what's happening. In Jeremiah 44, he, brought, he talks about the queen of heaven. Who's that? That's Isis. That's Ishtar. That's Sophia. That is the Hagia Sophia over there in the eastern branch of the church. You remember? In Istanbul, Turkey? The church is split in two. You've got, Constant, you've got Constantine that moves his capital to the east. And they name it Constantinople. And they build a wall around it. And it stands for a thousand years. And then eventually the Ottoman Turks overrun it. And when they do, they take that, that uh, Hagia Sophia and turn it into a mosque. That's what they always do. But Holy Sophia, the goddess worship. Have you noticed how in the Methodist churches and some of the Baptist in America and some of the mainline Protestant denominations, you got people in there talking about the goddess, the goddess, the goddess? You know why they're talking about the goddess? It's because they don't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That's the truth, folks. They don't know the true and living God. None of this stuff is new. And what happens is that there's a basic fundamental uh, message to it, but it goes out and it morphs when it gets off into different cultures, and they put their own spin on it, and they use their own names. But when you bring it back to its source, it's the same thing. See, it's the same thing. And uh, the whole idea is, we can be God, we can be the masters of our destiny, we can make this world a better place to live in, and we can come in contact with the gods, the spirit beings above us, and we don't need that, that Abrahamic God of Israel. We don't need that God. And that's the message that you're getting today. And I'm going to tell you something else, too. And I've watched the way they do this. They're good at it. They're slick at it. They'll use Christian terms and appear to be preaching the Christian gospel. But it's all semantics because they put their own spin on it. And so when they say something, it doesn't mean the same thing to them that it does to you. So you've got to watch these people. They're slick. They're very slick. And the acid test to anything, you judge a tree by the fruit it bears, don't you? The acid test is this. Do they preach the new birth or not? And if they don't preach the new birth where you have a change to life and the Lord Jesus Christ becomes the Lord of your life, if they don't preach that, they are false prophets. I don't care if they say they're preaching the gospel. And you got a crowd today that they're, they're, they're a bunch of, they have turned the grace of God into lasciviousness and they're telling people that all you got to do is believe the gospel. And if you add anything to that, you're adding works to it. All right? And they've accused me of telling people, uh, Lawson is telling people that you have, to, you have to repent in order to be saved. I never told you that. What I tell you is that if you believe the gospel and put saving faith in Christ, you will repent. Because that is fruit, that is the fruit of saving faith. What do they want then? What's it about? It's about this, folks. It's about accepting intellectually a religion. It's about believing what you see written in the book intellectually, but there's no change of heart. Because when the heart changes, your life changes. When your heart changes, you're going to repent. And there's no change of heart to these people. It's all sanitized. It's all, it's all like a, you're just cut and dried. It's mechanical. And salvation is not mechanical. Salvation is receiving the Lord Jesus Christ by faith into your heart. You receive him. You believe on the Son of God. And once you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have received the Holy Spirit. And once you've received him, a work begins to take place inside you. Something changes in you. Your heart changes. Your desires change. And you're going to do some heavy duty repenting. <laughs> you show me a crowd that doesn't believe in repentance and I'll show you a bunch, of, a, a bunch of Bible deniers and Christ rejectors. And I did not tell you that you had to repent to be saved, did I? You repent because you are saved. It's the fruit of, 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 uh, of uh, saving faith. But this is what I'm talking about. This is how... 
This is how this is how subtle this is. And so the emerging church is becoming part of this one world religion. It's becoming part of this, and they're going to use terms you use, but it doesn't mean the same thing to them as it does to you. This whole world is falling under the power of the Antichrist. It is, and the only way you're going to stay above it, the only way you're going to keep your head above it, is to stay in the book and keep praying and take the simple truths of Scripture and reiterate them, preach them, embrace them, and don't let them move you. Don't let them sway you from the truth. Amen. Amen. You're not saved because you prayed a sinner's prayer. You're saved because you received Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. I didn't mean getting all that preaching. <laughs> well, anyway, the branch. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, well, I've got a, a bunch of stuff here, but I don't hate to get started in it because we only got about three minutes left, so we'll just uh, close it off here. I, uh, I would suggest this. <laughs> Don't mess with Michael. <laughs> One angel of the Lord dispatched 185,000 of Sennacherib's troops. One angel. One. And it doesn't name him, but it simply says an angel. And he, I mean, they were dead. They were just a bunch of pile of corpse out there. That's all they had, just dead bodies. 185,000, folks. That's a big army. Good night, man. The division, 10, 15,000. You're looking at, you're looking at uh, 20, 25 divisions. You're looking at, uh, you're looking at, you're looking at, uh, with something like that, you're looking at a core. Uh, that's a huge army that's gathered out there. And one angel wipes it out, wipes it from the face of the earth, and it's gone. Amen. All right, we'll have word prayer, and we'll let you go. Father, I thank you, Lord. This time of study, I'm trying my best, Heavenly Father bring the truth out and it'll ring true in the ears of a lot of people it will because they 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 they've already wondered they've already got doubts they they can already see a lot of things that just don't add up and then when they hear something like this it starts to come together for them and i pray you'd bless them with it father i pray you'd give us give us understanding lord we're not children of the dark and we're not children of the night we're children of the day in jesus name i pray